Good morning. We'll be waiting here, as always, for a little bit. Doing something a little bit different today for our Bible study in remembrance of the Reformation. I my computer to start in. Here it is. We got one. I keep hearing these sounds here, you know, from the, from the it's so windy. You get little branches tapping and leaves rustling around. It always sounds really weird. It's like, oh, what's that? Wait a little bit longer. Um, like I said, we're going to be doing something a little different. We're taking a break just for today from our Genesis study and have something for the Reformation. This is a uh, this is based on a paper that I wrote in seminary. Oh, it goes way back. Um, and it was for a symbolics class. And the assignment was to, oh, well, the paper was to do this comparison between the way that Luther and the Reformation used certain terms and the way that the Catholic Church did. You might know that, uh, good morning, Judy, and whoever else is there. Judy's the only one that it tells me is one of the people, but I know there are others. So you might know that in like the late 90s, there was this joint declaration, supposedly, between the Lutherans. And by Lutherans here, the only Lutherans that were involved with this were like the ELCA and their Elks. They're not really Lutherans anyway. They don't speak for us, right? It was them and the Catholic Church, and it was supposed to joint declaration on justification. And every once in a while, I'll hear somebody will be like, oh, you know, we settled that difference. You know, we don't have this disagreement with Rome anymore. And it's a bunch of nonsense. And the document itself is such, such a joke because it uses terms intentionally, knowingly. They even said this. They knew that the Lutherans and the Roman theologians who were involved with this were using terms that they each separately had completely different definitions for. So they would say, well, look, we both agree with this document, but they only each agreed with it in their own different understanding of what it meant. You know, imagine that um, you were talking to a police officer after you had run a red light, and a uh, police officer says, you know, when you were coming out of that light, it, the light was yellow. You said, I agree with that. We both agree the light was yellow, so everything's fine here. And then he said, well, what do you think the yellow light means? And you said, well, it means speed up so you can get through the intersection. And he said, no, it means slow down. And, and then you said, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, if we think it means different things, we agree the light was yellow. That's all that matters. Well, obviously that's pointless. That, that's sort of like what's going on here. I want to start with this passage from Romans 3. It's kind of the pivotal uh, Reformation passage because it's the one that that Luther um, read, and while he was reading it, realized the gospel for the first time. This is Romans 3, 23 to 25. For all have sinned, actually, sorry, this is part of, of that section, it's not the whole section. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. You know, we really should be able to stop right there. When considering the question, how is a sinner made right with God, could Paul have been any more definitive? He says that Christ's redemption justifies us. The forgiveness of sins, life, salvation are poured out on us through this gift of faith and that it's all done as a free gift of God, grace. How could anyone misinterpret what Paul is saying? Well, of course, the problem comes when sinful humans make up their own things and then change God's word to fit what they think. That, that's exactly what had happened in the Catholic Church. Isn't it astounding? You know, God says that someone who rejects this is accursed. That's what Paul says in Galatians. If anyone should preach a different gospel to you than this one, let him be accursed. That means let him be damned. And yet, as we're going to see in some of these quotes, the Catholic Church 
then and still today in their official doctrines and their catechisms and the councils, they call anyone who confesses this accursed. Anyone who confesses this, they say, is damned. Isn't that crazy? How can that be? We're going to see as we go through here. The first section is uh, on the different definitions of the word grace. So this is Rome's position on the meaning of the word grace. It's from the Council of Trent. And one thing to remember here, too, people sometimes try to say, like, you know, that was back then. This is today. Look, the Roman Catholic Church upholds everything that I'm about to say as its official teaching and doctrine. It does not and has never even suggested that it rejects any part of any of the teachings of its councils. So this is from the Council of Trent, chapter 7 and 8, in canon number 9. If anyone says that a sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, let him be damned. Canon 11. If anyone says that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ or by the sole remission of sins to the exclusion of the grace and charity which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Ghost and remains in them, or also that the grace by which we are justified is only the good will of God, let him be damned. Canon 24. If anyone says that the justice received is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that those works are merely fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of the increase, let him be damned. Think about what those things revealed, okay? First, that grace is something poured into our hearts. That's, this is what the Catholics are saying. That grace is a thing that is poured into our hearts, which remains in our hearts, and helps us to increase in good works, and by those good works, to partake in gaining our salvation. Second, they specifically said that grace is not merely the good will of God, and that if anyone says that that's what it is, that person should be damned. And this is further demonstrated by many other statements from the Catholic Church. This is in the Confutation, Part 2, Article 3. A little history. The uh, Lutheran Confession of the Faith, the Augsburg Confession, was presented, and the Catholic theologians were asked to write a response. Actually, Emperor Charles V asked them, can you, can you refute this, this doctrine, this apology, this, this, um, this uh, Augsburg Confession? And they said, from the scriptures? No. From the fathers? Yes. And then they wrote this confutation. They say, the mass does not abolish sins which are destroyed by, by repentance as their peculiar medicine, but abolishes the punishment due sin, supplies satisfactions, and confers increase of grace and salutary protection of the living, and lastly, brings the hope of divine consolation and aid to all our wants and necessities. And it's the increase of grace. The Confrontation Part 1, Article 4. If anyone should intend to disapprove of the merits that men acquire by the assistance of divine grace, he would agree with the Manichaeans rather than with the Catholic Church, for it is entirely contrary to Holy Scripture to deny that our works are meritorious. You hear that? It is entirely contrary to Scripture to deny that our works are meritorious. Rome saw and still does see grace as an outpouring of God's power, which we first earn to help us to do good works, which in turn earn our salvation. All right, this is the way the system works, okay? So to them, grace is sort of like a spiritual steroid injection, okay? You're, you're like a bodybuilder, and you need to be able to lift more weight. So you get this kind of steroid injection from God, that makes you stronger so you can lift more weight, and then that in turn gets you more injections so you can lift more weight. It's like you earn another level, you get more, you know, grace steroids, you get stronger, and that's how you get to heaven. So when the Catholic says that we believe that they believe they're saved by grace, and they will say that, this is what they mean. They say, all right, here's the way it goes. Human beings are sinful, but they're not completely dead in sin. There's still a little bit of good in us. This is very, very similar to the Baptist idea of you being able to ask Jesus into your heart because you're not completely dead. That's their idea, okay? So, when a person, by this sort of natural goodness that is in them, you know, does kind of a little bit, makes a little bit of a motion towards God, that motion towards God, they say, it's not good enough to earn salvation, but it is good enough, they say, to, to earn from God a gift of his grace whereby he gives them faith. Now notice what's happening there. They're saying that you, by your natural ability, 
can do enough to earn something from God that he is obligated to give you faith. Not a gift of grace, but something you have earned. That's what they're saying. Then, once you start that, it's sort of like this leveling up process. Like you're playing some kind of video game. And you, and you get your steroid injection from God, his grace, that's what they call it, in the sacraments and whatever. And then that makes you stronger so you can do more good works. And it is by those good works which are assisted by his grace that you earn salvation. That's their position. That's what they mean when they say that we're saved by grace. Well, this, what's Luther's position? When I looked up the word, I looked up the word grace, and I have this anthology, a book called What Luther Says. And it's just it's three books filled with these quotes from Luther about different topics, and it's, it's great. You can imagine the number of quotes you, I found when I searched for grace, and here's a few. This is on page 603 of What Luther Says. What now follows belongs, I hold, to the gifts of the Spirit which follow the remission of sins. For Paul teaches a difference between grace on the one hand and gifts on the other. Grace signifies that favor with which God receives us, forgiving our sins and justifying us freely through Christ. Do not consider it a quality in man as the sophists dream it is. According to the usage of Scripture, grace signifies that favor of God which wishes us well and justifies us. That is, it freely grants us the faith which alone justifies us. Now, in the entire Scripture, we nowhere read that justification is ascribed to love, since love is rather the fruit of justifying faith. As in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. A good song may well be sung often, Grace consists in this, that God is merciful to us, shows himself gracious for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, forgives all sins, and will not impute them unto us for eternal death. This is grace, the forgiveness of sins for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, the covering up of all sins. Notice what Luther is saying. That what grace added, as in its essence is, is an attitude of God toward us. It's love. You've probably heard the definition before. Grace is God's undeserved love. And it is that love which caused him to send his son. It is that love which freely led Christ to die for us. It is that love which, on the basis of what Christ has done, forgives us, gives us his spirit, gives us faith. All of these gifts, all of these things that he does for us, they are from his grace. And in a sense, you could talk about them as being grace. They are gracious because they're from his grace. His grace is their origin. But at its essence, what the Bible is saying is that grace is an attitude of God toward us. And this is a very clearly a different view from what Rome is saying. The, uh, Jacob Preuss writes about this. He says, a believer has faith hope, and love, but it is never said that a believer has grace. Luther maintains that by teaching that grace is a spiritual quality in man, the papists have imposed an alien metaphysics upon the scriptural doctrine of grace, thus resulting in unbearable confusion. So when Luther and the confessors speak of God giving his grace, they are referring not to an infusion of a quality, which henceforth resides in man, but to a mighty, free, loving, giving, active God, by whereby he elects us in Christ, justifies and forgives us for Christ's sake, blesses, sanctifies, and saves us, and all that freely given out of his grace in Christ. Luther and the Reformers present the grace of God as God's favor, his benevolent and good disposition and intention toward fallen mankind. Grace is more than a mere quiescent intention, however. Grace is active. It is an action as God demonstrates his love and grace in sending his son to save sinners, to justify them, to call, enlighten, convert, and sanctify his children. So what he's saying there is he's heightening this, okay? With God, an attitude is never just an attitude. God always acts out what he feels. His love for us is not just a feeling, it's not just an attitude towards us, but leads to action. So God's disposition towards us of being gracious and loving despite our sins causes him to do those gracious works by which he saves us. So the question now is who is right? We've shown there's a clear, consistent difference between the way the Roman theologians use the word grace back then and today and the way that Luther and the reformers use it. So the real question is, you know, what does scripture say? Well, look at some passages. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved 
through faith. And that is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Look at that. Look at the way that Paul doubly sets apart grace and works. He's saying works have nothing to do with grace. Grace is from God, and it means that he gives us a gift. He says that your salvation through faith is not something you did. Your salvation isn't something you did. Your faith isn't something you did. Both are rather the gift of God. Now, Ephesians 2.5, he says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ by grace. You have been saved. Notice God's doing the action, and his explanation of that is by grace. 2 Timothy 1.19, Who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Before the ages began. He gave us his grace before the ages began. Well, how could grace be this sort of infusion that God puts into us, by whereby we, by our works, earn salvation, when he gave it to us before the ages began, before we were born? That doesn't make any sense. But it does make sense if grace is God's favor and love toward us, which leads him to send his own heart and soul and son, Jesus Christ, to save us. Romans 11, 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. All four of these passages clearly show that works and grace have nothing to do with each other. They're opposites. The concept of grace is one that necessitates the absence of any works at all. See, even in their linguistic formation, I mean, I mean even in the, their lexical meaning, the Greek words mean the opposite of each other. Works equals reward, right? You know, Paul talks about this in one section in Romans, that if you work for something, like, it, you know, if you're working at your job and you get your paycheck, okay, and, you're, and, you're, uh, and your boss comes and says, here you go, I got a gift for you, and he gives you the paycheck. You know, he might be joking, right, tongue-in-cheek, but if he wasn't joking, you'd be like, dude, this isn't a present. This isn't a gift. I earned this. This is my wages. It's what I get for what I have done, Right? So grace is the opposite of that. Grace is when you get something you did not do anything for. And that's why Romans 3 says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So all of these show that. The Catholics are using grace in a totally foreign way to the scripture. You know, another example of this is with the Lord's Supper. Rome saw then, and still sees today, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper as a source of grace. That is, a source of those kind of spiritual steroids by which man can persevere and earn heaven. Luther, backed by God's word, knew that this wasn't true. Holy communion is a means of grace. It's a means by which God pours out the blessings of his undeserved love on us. That is, the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation won by Jesus Christ. The sacrament itself does not produce grace. It gives us grace, because in it, Christ, who died and rose, comes to us. Another passage is Romans 5.15. But the free gift, and remember, uh, I've mentioned this before, but the word gift in Greek is from the same word as the word is translated grace, because a free gift is a gift that is given on the basis of an attitude of love, not something that's earned. And so the words fit together in their lexical meanings. You only, you can't say, I deserve this, I earned this. You say, somebody gave this to me. Like, it was on your birthday, your parents gave you a present, not because you, they had to, not because you earned it or deserved it, because they wanted to. So the gift is a result of their love, of their grace. So Romans 5.15, the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many die through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound for many. Notice what's key there. The grace of God and the free gift by or from that grace. This passage shows us that the gifts of God are not essentially the same thing as the grace of God. Two different things are spoken of. There is God's grace, his any way love towards us, and then there is the gift by that grace. They're very related. It is a gracious gift because it comes from grace. 
God's grace is the reason for all the wonderful gifts that he gives to us, but it is not in itself those things, such as hope, joy, love, faith, etc. These gifts are only given to us once we have been given, by God's grace, the gift of faith. That's subjective justification. As Paul writes, many all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So, we're justified by grace. That is because of his love towards us. And then it says, as a gift. It's given to us. His grace is given to us through the redemption. That is through the redemption of Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross. And that's how we're saved. So that's, that's grace, all right? You have what Luther's saying, what the, what, the, what, the Luth, what the confessors of the Reformation are saying, what the Catholics are saying, they're a mile apart, and Scripture is 100% over here with Luther. Next, how about justification? Uh, I had this in the sermon today. Justification by faith alone is the doctrine in which the church or the individual stands or falls. It's a quote from Martin Luther. All right, so we've seen that grace is that undeserved love of God that caused him to act mercifully in human history to bring about the salvation of men. The next question is, what is justification? As is clearly seen from the quote I just mentioned, that's a very important question to Luther. So here's Rome's position. This is what they say justification is. It's from the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent, chapter 7. The disposition or preparation of justification itself follows, which is not merely the remission of sins, but also the sanctification and renewal of the inward man through the voluntary reception of the grace and gifts, whereby man from unjust becomes just, and from an enemy, friend, so that he may be an heir according to the hope of eternal life. Okay, think about what that's saying. It's saying that justification is not essentially just the forgiveness of sins, but it is both God forgiving your sins and then your work towards getting rid of sin in your life, okay? So that the whole process is involved. It's not just what God gives you, does for you, says to you, declares to you, but it's also what you do after that. The process by which you become more sanctified, you become more holy, the process by which you say, oh, I don't know, stop cursing, or the process by which you, you know, uh, become a better person, a better husband. That's what they're saying, quite clearly. So what they're saying is that sanctification and the forgiveness of sins are not two separate things, but two parts of one whole, and they call that justification. Another quote from the, the Confutation. Ye are my friends, Christ says, if ye do whatsoever I command you. On this account, their frequent ascription of justification to faith is not admitted since it pertains to grace and love. For St. Paul says, though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Here St. Paul certifies to the princes and the entire church that faith alone does not justify. All right, the, that John passage being quoted is a joke. It shows a complete lack of understanding of the scripture because they don't understand the gospel. Jesus is not saying to the disciples, I will only justify you if you do whatever I command you. They are his friends. They are his friends, he says. He has loved them with an everlasting love, which is grace. Jesus is explaining to his disciples some of the privilege of being his friends. A friend of Jesus does what Jesus says, not to earn something from him, but because he trusts that his Savior is his friend. It was earlier on that evening that Jesus said to the disciples, you are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. That certainly is the word of the gospel, the word of justification. Funny how he didn't say you are clean partly because of the word and partly because of the works that you do. Well, the other passage they quote is also hilarious, 1 Corinthians 13:2. They say, this passage, though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. Notice, they're saying, this means that Paul is saying that a person can have faith and not love, and that if a person has, person has faith without love, then they're not justified. Therefore, they say, that means you need faith and love to be justified. Okay. They're not paying any attention to what Paul's doing here. Paul is not talking about reality. He is, he is speaking about what people suppose to be the case. He's talking about people who think they have faith and do not have love. People who are saying, look, I've got faith, so it doesn't matter that I don't have love. James does the same thing in James chapter 2. He says, someone will say, I have faith, and another person will say, I have works. See? And Paul says, such faith is dead. Sorry, James says, that faith is dead. What he means is it's not faith. And that's what Paul means too. That's why he says, I am nothing. He says, if you say, I have faith, but you don't have love, 
You don't have anything. You don't have faith or love. Hebrews 11 says it this way, without faith, it's impossible to please God. What pleases God is love, right? Love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is the commandment. So love only comes from faith. Anywhere where there is love, there must already be faith. And anywhere there, where there is faith, there must also be love. So if a person is saying, I've got faith but not love, they don't have either. And that's the point of this passage. And the Catholics are trying to use it to say the opposite. Then here's another quote from the Confutation, Article 6. But in the same article, their ascription of justification to faith alone is diametrically opposed, opposite, sorry, the truth in the gospel by which works are not excluded, because glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, from Romans 2. Why? Because David, Christ, and Paul testified that God will render to everyone according to his works. Besides, Christ says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Hence, however much one may believe, if he work not what is good, he is not a friend of God. That's from the Confutation. Indeed, God does say that he will reward the good works that we do, yet those works cannot be done until we are brought to faith. The scriptures show that the greatest rewards, forgiveness, life, salvation, peace, are already all given to us through faith by Christ alone. These then cannot be the rewards spoken of in the passages that they quote. We consider also what they say about the merits of congruity and condignity. Uh, I'll mention that again in a second. They imagine that men, before they are even brought to faith, are able of their own strength to do certain works which earn them God's favor. We talked about that before. So these works are called merits of congruity. By doing these works, before they're brought to faith, man is supposed to earn from God that first infusion of grace which allows him to do more works. Those are called merits of condignity. And these works they claim work justification. By them, in part, they blaspheme and say that a man is made right with God. So, follow what they're doing here. Justification is this long process by which a person goes from being an unbeliever, and then the next step is, he, by doing some good works as an unbeliever, he earns God's favor towards him enough so that God will make him a believer. Then, he's, he's a weak believer, but he's like a weak believer, okay? Then, he's got to exercise, get some grace, do more good works so that he earns more from God and more and more and more and more. And as he earns more and more, he gets to be a better and better person, and he's not really justified until he gets all the way there. Preuss says, but the Luther, both the Lutheran doctrine that justification by grace is a declaration of total acquittal, and the Roman Catholic doctrine that justification by God's grace is a transformation or change wrought in the sinner by infused grace. So that he's just, I don't know why at the beginning of the quotes is both. He's contrasting the two. So here's the Lutheran's position. Jacob Price writes, to Chemnitz, Martin Chemnitz, by the way, he's a Lutheran theologian shortly after the time of Luther, uh, one of the greatest theologians of Lutheran history. To Chemnitz, even repentance and faith, which receives the mercy and grace of God, do not merit justification or God's grace, but are the results of his grace. The sinner is justified by grace alone for Christ's sake. So here's some quotes from Luther on the topic, from what Luther says, page 701 and following. By the one solid rock, which we call the doctrine of justification, we mean that we are redeemed from sin, death, and the devil, and are made partakers of life eternal, not by ourselves, but by help from without, by the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ. Another one, by faith alone in Christ without works are we declared just and saved. Another one, I say nothing about the fact that sophists are wont to argue about the possible return of sin that is once forgiven, for they do not know what forgiveness of sin is. They imagine it is something which clings to the heart and lies there, whereas it is in reality the entire kingdom of Christ, which endures forever without ceasing. The sun continues to shine and to radiate light even though I close my eyes. Just so, this mercy seat, or forgiveness of sins, stands forevermore, even though I fall. And just as I again see the sun when I reopen my eyes, just so I again have the forgiveness of sins when I arise and again come to Christ. Uh, speaking about Galatians 4, Luther says, Nothing more is required for justification than to hear of Jesus Christ and to believe on him as Savior. Again, there's clearly a major difference here between Luther's definition of justification and Rome's. To the one, it is the full, free, mighty, active God in Jesus Christ that removes the sins of the whole world and provides every person with the white robes of Christ's righteousness. To the other, to Rome, it is nothing but law. Do this, 
with some help from God, and you will live. That's what they're saying. But what do the scriptures say? Well, Romans 3.20. By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. In other words, he's saying whenever the law is applied to human beings, it reveals sin. Why? Because there's sin in us. Because we're dead in sin. We're filled with sin. And every single time that the law is brought to us, that is what it does. The law never justifies, ever, because we never keep it. The law can only say what it says. And what the law says is be holy or else. The law doesn't change its proclamation based on whether you're better than somebody else or based on whether you're getting better. You know, um, I was watching this show, uh, the Good Place. It's a pretty interesting show. It's kind of funny. Uh, quite a bit more appropriate. It's not completely appropriate, but way more appropriate than most sitcoms. And it's interesting because uh, it's, it takes this exploration of philosophy. Okay? And I, I think that's interesting. It's not accurate. It's not right. Human philosophy isn't right. But it, it lets us get an idea of the way that people think. And it gives a glimpse into the natural knowledge of God. And one of the final conclusions of this show is that what really matters to be a good person is simply to be getting better. Okay? The law doesn't care about that. The law isn't like, all right, you're getting better. That's fine. The law is just totally black and white. That is all that is capable of declaring because that is what it is. Okay? And so the law always reveals sin. The law always condemns us for our sins because we are sinners. So the law cannot justify. And that's why Romans says, no, by the law, by any kind of law, no one will ever be justified. Romans 3.24. This is right after it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then it says, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Think about that for a second. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified. Notice who it is that are justified. The all who sin. That's everybody. They all sin, but they're justified. How? Not by the law, but by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3.28. We hold, therefore, that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. You know what's great about this passage? In Luther's version of this, and in some English versions, he added the word, uh, we hold that a person justified by faith alone. And then the Romans and the Romans are like, look, Luther added to the Bible. Well, check it out. The word that is in there is apart from. Okay, here's the question that you have. How is a person justified? Well, it has to either be by what God does, or by what we do, or by some combination of the two, right? Those are the only logical options. So if you say that it is by God's grace, apart from works, what's another way of saying that? Like a one word word that says the same thing? Oh yeah, alone, faith alone, not works. It's exactly what Paul's saying. Luther's not adding a word. He's expressing in his own language, as we are in ours, the exact meaning of the inspired Greek that God wrote. We hold that one is justified by faith, alone, apart from the works of the law. In other words, works have nothing to do with it. So any teaching that suggests that works of any kind, other than Christ's works, uh, that our works at all have anything to do with our justification, is clearly false. Romans 5, 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Justified by his blood. It doesn't say by works. Galatians 3. Now it is evident, that means it's obvious, that no one is justified before God by the law. For, according to the Old Testament, the righteous shall live by faith. See, Paul there in Galatians makes this contrast. He says, that's not the way the law speaks. The law says the one who does the law shall live by the law. But the one who doesn't shall die. But... What does it say about the righteousness of faith? The one who believes lives. The righteous is the one who lives by faith, not by what he does. Galatians 5, 4, we had this in our sermon. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Titus 3, 7. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 
Romans 5.18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. That's a great one, because notice what it's contrasting. Adam's single act of sin and Christ's single act, and by the single act it means his life, his death, his resurrection, it's taking the whole thing as a whole, right? That one act of Adam's sin damned everyone. We're all going to hell because of Adam. That, that's what it says. Because he sinned, we're all guilty for his sin, and also we inherit from him a sinful nature, and because of that, we sin, and we bring damnation on ourselves. Okay, one act led to all of us, the whole world, being damned. By contrast, one act of one man, Jesus Christ, the son of Adam, our brother, leads to justification and life for all men. Not by anything in us, but by his one act. Now, the Catholic theologians would say that James 2, 21 to 24 would seem to contradict this. James 2, 21 to 24 says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Rome often turns to such passages in James over against the clear words found elsewhere. It needs to be remembered that while Paul is speaking of the way that a sinner is declared righteous before God, James is speaking of what men see. So, first of all, we always want to remember God doesn't contradict himself. Okay, So, Paul and James are, can't be saying opposite things, even though they seem to be saying opposite things. So what are they actually saying? Well, I mentioned before that in this section, James is talking to people who are supposing that you can have faith, or you can have works, and you can have one without the other. And so he has this little description. He says, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. And then he says, what good does it do if somebody comes to you and they're hungry, and you say to them, be clothed and warmed and fed, and then you don't actually do anything? And he says, so also faith without works is dead. His point is not actually, he's not actually making any comment specifically about how you should feed the poor. I mean, he does that elsewhere. He's making an illustration. He's saying, if you just wish for somebody to be warmed and fed and you don't actually do anything, well, that's an empty wish. It's no good. It's, well, what's the point of that? And so he says, if you have a faith that doesn't work, it's not faith. And so his point is then that before in the sight of men, works show that we have faith. And they're so closely connected that you can point to somebody's works and say, hey, look, that, that person is doing good works. That must come from faith. That person is justified. You can tell it by his works. But he's not saying that you're actually justified before God by your works. We know that because Paul very clearly, far more clearly than James, speaks to this issue and makes it quite clear that, as we've seen, we're justified by faith alone. So that brings us to the last one. We've seen what the different views of grace and justification. Grace, the Lutheran view, the scriptural view, is that it's God's attitude of love towards us, which causes him to send his son for us, to die for us, to save us. Justification, uh, the, uh, sorry, the Catholic view of grace is it's a spiritual steroid that allows you to earn your own salvation. Justification, the Catholic view, is that it's this process whereby you become a better person, and it's both faith and works, it's all together, and that's how you're saved. The Lutheran view, the scriptural view, is that it is a declaration from God. In Jesus Christ, he justifies the world. That is, he forgives the sins of the world. That's, we call that one universal, objective justification, and that that message is proclaimed, and when someone believes it, it becomes theirs. It doesn't do anyone any good if they don't have faith. That's why it's justification by faith. God did it for everyone, he declared it to everyone, but it's only ours when we grab it by faith, and God gives us that faith. And the moment we believe that, it's all ours. And notice how Luther, in that one quote where he's talking about, if you close your eyes, you don't see the sunshine, the sunshine's not gone. You open your eyes again, and it's there again. He's saying that the forgiveness of sins is like that, because it's outside of us. God's forgiveness stands complete. It's yours. If, for a while, you fall away and you don't believe it, well, it's not yours, but it's still there, and it's still for you. And if you are brought to faith again, and you look at that forgiveness, you look at the Son, 
it's still there, it's always been there, it's yours, it's outside of you. It's not your works, it's a full and complete thing. This is really good to remember. Like, when you're at church and um, the pastor says, I forgive you all your sins, when you receive the Lord's Supper, or not even just a pastor, a fellow Christian says, you know, you confess a sin and he says, you know, you're forgiven. And when you're at the Lord's Supper and you receive the body and blood of the Lord, what you are receiving is not the forgiveness of like, oh, the sins of the day or the sins of the last week, blah, blah, blah. It's the whole deal. It's all sin, all of it forgiven every time. Whenever you go to the Lord's Supper, whenever you receive the absolution, you are receiving nothing new. And yet, it's always new. Because the Lord's mercies are always new. You're receiving the same thing again and again, and how much we need it, and how much you rejoice in it. So that's the difference there. Well, what about faith? What is Roman's position on faith? From the Council of Trent, Canon 12. If anyone says that justifying faith is nothing else than trust in divine mercy, or that it is this trust alone by which we are justified, let him be damned. Jacob Preuss says the Tridentine Fathers, that's some Catholic writers, described justifying faith according to the old scholastic pattern of thought as an infused virtue and a faith formed by love. Faith is considered a virtue which along with hope and love constitutes the beginning of the justification process. The Confutation, Part Three. Oh, sorry, Part Two, Article Three. It has been sufficiently declared above that we are justified not properly by faith but by love. Directly contradicting Paul here, right? But if any such statement be found in the Holy Scriptures, you know, like like the fifteen passages we just read, Catholics know that it is declared concerning fides formata, which works by love. That means formed faith. And because justification is begun by faith, because it is the substance of things hoped for. They're saying, whatever the scripture says that we're justified by faith alone, it doesn't really mean that. It means faith that has the way that we get started by faith and the way that we finish it by law. That's what they're saying. In the Confutation, Part 1, Article 6, uh, we read this one actually already uh, about John 15, you're my friend if you do what I command you. Well, what's the Lutheran's position? Jacob Preuss says, what is faith when considered in the context of justification? What is the function or role of faith in the justification of a sinner? Lutherans, justifying faith, not faith as it relates to prayer or hope or the fruits of the Spirit or faith that bears the cross or as knowledge of theology. They are referring to general faith which holds to all the articles of the Christian doctrine, trust, confidence, assurance. The Apology um, of the Augsburg Confession, Article 4, number 48, says this. But that faith which justifies is not merely a knowledge of history. Not merely this, that I know the stories of Christ's birth, suffering, etc. That even the devils know. But it is to assent to the promise of God, in which, for Christ's sake, the remission of sins and justification are freely offered. It is the certainty, or the certain trust in the heart, when with my whole heart I regard the promises of God as certain and true, through which they are offered me, without my merit, the forgiveness of sins, grace, and all salvation through Christ the Mediator, and that no one may suppose that it is mere knowledge, we will add further. It is to wish and to receive the offered promise of the remission of sins and of justification. Faith is that my whole heart takes to itself this treasure. It is not my doing, not my presenting or giving, not my works or preparation, but that a heart comforts itself and is perfectly confident with respect to this, namely, that God makes a present and a gift to us, and not we to him, that he sheds upon us every treasure of grace in Christ. Here's from what Luther says, pages 466 to 470. Faith is an unceasing and constant looking, which turns the eyes upon nothing but Christ, the victor over sin and death, and the giver of righteousness, salvation, and a life eternal. This is why Paul, in his epistles, sets Jesus Christ before us and teaches about him in almost every single verse. But he sets him before us through the word, for in no other way can he be apprehended except by faith in the word. Faith is the yes of the heart, a conviction on which one stakes one's life. On what does faith rest? On Christ, born of a woman, made under the law, who died, etc., as the children pray in the Apostles' Creed. To this confession I say yes, with the full confidence of my heart. Christ came for my sake, in order to free me from the law, not only from the guilt of sin, but also from the power of the law. 
Christian faith is not an idle quality or an empty husk in the heart which could exist amid mortal sin until love is added and makes it alive. But if faith is real, it is a sure confidence of the heart and a firm assent by which Christ is apprehended in such a way that he is the object of faith. In fact, not the object either, but to put it this way, in such faith Christ himself is present. Again, there's a major difference between what Rome is saying and what Luther is saying, and God's word is clear on this point as well. Matthew 14, 31, Jesus says, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of Peter, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? Acts 27, 25, So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. Why did he have faith? You remember that Paul on the ship? Uh, why did he have faith? Well, God had told him that nobody was going to die. So Paul had faith because God told him. Romans 3, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. Now this is a really key one, Romans 4, 5. And to the one who does not work but trusts in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Notice the one not working but trusting. Again, they're opposites. The person who is justified by God is the one who trusts in God and does not work. Romans 4.20, no distrust made him waver. Oh, sorry, I've got to go back. I just said something that you might misunderstand. Paul's not saying that the believer does not do works. We talked about that before. He's saying the one who trusts in God even though he has no works that are worthy of anything, who does not try to approach God by working, but by trusting. He's separating in the area of the doctrine of justification, completely separating faith and works. Okay? Romans 4.20. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Notice what it does there. He says no distrust made him waver in the promise, and then he says that's what faith is. Faith is trust in the promise. That's all it is. It's not just knowing who God is and what God has done. The demons know that. It is saying yes. It is grabbing it. It is trusting it. It is believing it. In these passages, as well as others, faith is clearly defined as trust in the promises of God. There are other usages of the word, such as in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Here, the faith is used as a reference to that which is believed, that which is trusted in. The context will generally make clear which one is the case, but even that is emphasizing what we just mentioned, that faith itself is trust, because the body of the faith are those things which we trust in, the promises of God in what God has done for us. Rome has, in many ways, mucked up what faith truly is. They say that it is not only trust in God. They say that it is a virtue, like patience or kindness or, I don't know, good manners. They are saying that it's a good work. They say that love is an integral part of faith, but not in the way we say it. We say, you know, faith always exists with love, but love and faith are not the same thing. It's true that James says faith without works is dead, but they are once again getting the cart before the horse. Faith is always accompanied by works. That's what James is writing about. But that doesn't mean that faith in and of itself is works. Faith is taking God at his word. Hence James' comment that it is useless to ask for wisdom without faith. Because you, he talks about that and says, if you ask without faith, it's like a wave of the sea. What's the point? You shouldn't suppose you receive anything from the Lord. Why would you ask God for something that you're not sure he'll give you? That's what James is saying. Whenever we pray, we should pray with faith. That is confident. How do we have confidence before God? When he has promised us something. So faith is to lay hold of the promises of God and apply them to yourself. Faith is how God transmits all the blessings which his grace has worked for us to us. I suppose the question really comes down to this. Where will you stand on the last day? Where will your trust be? Rome would stand with one foot on Christ and the other one on their works. They will fall. Have you ever tried standing with one foot on a dock and one foot on a boat that is not tied to the dock? Or even is tied, but you know, not that tightly? You know what happens. You can't stand with one foot on one thing and one on another. The Bible says this, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Luther's confession, by contrast, is quite different. For him, both feet are planted firmly on the rock 
of salvation in Jesus Christ. So it was that on this doctrine, everything stands or falls. It is on this doctrine that we will either stand or fall. It is on this truth that each person will either stand or fall in the presence of the Almighty God. It is by this power that we lay hold on all the promises of God in Christ alone. That's what all these really come down to. What is faith? It is trust in Christ alone. It's simple. We can't do it, but it's simple. God gives it to us. It is this yes to all of God's promises in Christ. What is justification? It's Christ alone. What is, what is a grace? It's Christ alone. God's love for us is shown in Christ alone. Christ is the grace of God. God's love and tender compassion towards us, that is Christ. God loved the world, John 3, 16, in this way that he gave his only begotten son. That's grace. That's justification. The word justified by faith alone through the righteousness of Jesus Christ and nothing of ourselves. And, you know, that's why, for instance, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but on, on Reformation, sometimes you'll see three solas and or five. The Lutheran version is three. The solas, the alones, grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. The more reformed or Protestant thing is to add um, Christ alone and to God with the glory alone. Look, I'm not going to bicker about that too much here because it's fine. Those things are true. But there is a reason why the Lutherans only have the three. And the reason is that grace alone, faith alone, and scripture alone, each one of those is Christ alone. And each one of those does mean to God be the glory alone, because that means God does it all. God gets all the glory, that means God gets all the credit, because God did all the work in Christ alone. Faith, grace, justification. All right, um, that's it for today. Uh, happy Reformation to all of you, and the grace of our Lord Jesus be with each of you.